what is it, what's that phrase? A prison so complete you don't realize you're in it. That's right. It's like information warfare from the Chinese Communist Party, where they're changing Wikipedia, but then they're also changing the Google search results, and then they buy a domain, and then they have a political thing, and you just go, well, this has to be the case. Look how many... There's The information warfare space is so big, you don't realize you're on the battlefield, except now it's inf infinitely large, because it's the entire information space that you consume, or it's in your brain implant, or where, however far along we are with AI at that point. I'll give you a fun one. So, yeah. is Taiwan a country? Well, <clears throat> so... <laughs> Depends who you ask. As my Taiwanese wife at the mixer nods her head vigorously. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you, is it? you know, you know that any Western company that's in business with China is in business with China when they produce a map or a movie or anything else that indicates that mm -hmm. Taiwan is not a country, right? Because it's extremely important to the Chinese Communist Party that Taiwan not be considered a country. Mm -hmm. There was, I remember, there was that NBA general manager who got in trouble because he like retweeted some tweet that talked about Taiwan as a country and like yeah. China flipped their lid and threatened to kick you know NBA out of, out yeah. of China. And so like even a map that has it right. on there or not on there is a whole thing. Exactly whether the map has right. Exactly there was a controversy around the map in the Barbie movie mm -hmm. uh, about whether it showed the. The, the, the South, the South Pacific Islands, that yeah, the are, South that are disputed, China Sea, the, the border in the South China Sea. Yeah, like it does. Does it include that as part of China, or is that also? And yeah, and then it's like you can't show the movie in Vietnam because it includes Vietnamese waters. It's a whole bunch of crap. And, and so, if you ask the AI, is Taiwan a country? What does it say right now? Well, Depends yeah. where you are. It probably does. Yeah. Really. Because we don't want to get banned in Beijing. So when you're there, it's like Taiwan is a province of China. By the way, China's making its own AIs. And I'm the, sure. the Chinese AIs are, of course, you know, trained in a very specific way. Well, I am, I'm curious about the, the China stuff because it, it almost seems like going back and forth on whether or not it's safe to develop AI, AGI in the first place, it kind of misses the point, right? Because even if we are like, we're not doing this, it's going to be dangerous. China's not going to be like, sure, you know what? You guys are right. Let's definitely not do this and accidentally take over the world. Yeah, as a result. Right. That's right. And we've already seen how the CCP essentially wants to project power onto the rest of the world yeah. and put their own worldview on the countries that it influences. And every tank – for the tankies out there, <laughs> I'll ask you what they're going to ask me. Isn't the United States going to do the same thing? Yeah. And, and the reason that's – well, why is that better? Well, whose values, right? Mm -hmm. Whose values? Oh like, yeah, I mean you're not you're, you're preaching to the choir. Yeah, yeah. Look, this is the question. I mean, this this is the question. I, I'm not going to answer. I mean, I, I'll answer the question for myself, which sure. is obviously American values. But like, yeah. it, there is a general. Uh, that's just me. There is a general abstract question, right? Afoot in the world, there are two. You know, we're we, we're back to a bi we're, if, in terms of like technology strength, we're back to a bipolar world, right? And we're back into a cold war dynamic, like we were with the Russians and and, and, and nuclear technology. Um, and there there are two AI superpowers, um, and they're America and China, and they both have visions and worldviews, and they both have a determination to proliferate those visions and worldviews through their technology globally. And yeah. the technology is going to encode whatever those respective societies think are the appropriate worldviews, right? That's what alignment means. And so we, we know what the Chinese AI is going to encode. It's going to encode Xi Jinping thought mm -hmm. and socialism and, you know, socialism, what they call socialism with Chinese characteristics. It's going yes. to encode communism, um, right? Um, and Chinese supremacy. Um, and that's what it's going to be. And they're very clear. I mean, this is very, they're very clear on this. They publish this. They talk about this. They're very open about it. Like that this is what they're doing. Yeah, they have a whole sort of manifesto about waging war on the West without actually using their military and this is part of it. Right, this is part of it yeah. and how they proliferate technology and it's going to run out, you know, all the, all the other stuff that they've been doing around they call Digital Silk Road where they, they, they their Digital Belt and Road where they, they spread all this stuff out. Um, and so, yeah, and then and then there's America and like we're going to, we are, you know, we're in the West, like we, you know, America is by far the leading AI, you know, country um, and our yeah, technology- Right. And our technology yeah. is going to proliferate, you know, very broadly. Um, and there's a big fight coming up, you know, between kind of those two worldviews. Um, what's interesting about it is the Chinese worldview is very clear because it's set top down. Mm -hmm. um, right. Yeah. The American worldview is like a little up in the air. Right. It's, it's all the discussions we're having before. It's like, OK, what do we actually think? Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and, and we, we, we have a level of internal conflict on that that the Chinese don't have to worry about. Yeah. The top down management, if you can call it management, is really is, is something. And that gives authoritarian regimes a bit of an edge when it comes to a lot of this stuff, of course, because they don't have to bounce it off of other stakeholders. It's just whoever the guy at the top, whatever the guy at the top thinks. Although, and we've covered this on the show before, dictators make a ton of mistakes because they don't have to bounce anything off anybody else. And they're surrounded by yes men. And I've seen demos of Chinese AI, at least the publicly available stuff. And it's really, some of it's quite comical. Yeah. Not that our AIs don't make any mistakes, but it's really clear that one is just Google translating whatever chat GPT spat out and it does it wrong. It'll translate like an idiom back into English and you go, that's not, not only is that not AI, Google Translate wouldn't have gotten that wrong. And so you do wonder if this is just like Bing or whatever sort of 
free AI that's been translated into Mandarin for purposes of whatever video that is. So that's does the Chinese AI, of, what does it think about spicy foods, though? Uh, that's a good question. I would assume it's got a wide range of thought because you have spicy, but then you have the numbing spicy, which I kind of prefer. Yeah, that this, there are a lot of philosophical questions here that we don't have time for, Mark. Um, <laughs> let's see. This, so far, so far, this is interesting. I do think that the medium term, I don't mean the conversation. That's, of course, interesting. I mean the the, the race between China and the United States. I do. I am worried, of course, in the medium term, whether or not China gets quantum or or AGI supremacy before us, because I'm not convinced. If the United States got AGI, we might prevent military AGI from other countries. But I feel like if China got AGI, they'd prevent everything. But I could be wrong. That's just how they treat their own people, and that's only that's kind of what I would expect. What do you think? So both countries have declared AI to be a central national priority. Thank, um, in the thankfully. U yes. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, good, probably good. Yeah. Um, so in the U.S., the form of that is something. It's a, they have, they have a, the term they use for it is they call offset. Um, and so uh, the, in, in in American national security world, the term offset basically is a te technology shift that basically renders all previous military technology obsolete effectively. And so the, the and there have been three offsets in the last seventy years. The first one was nuclear weapons. Um, mm -hmm. The second one was so, so called maneuver warfare, um, sort of integration of information systems for rapid battle field mm. mobility, precision strikes, you know, things like that, precision bombs. Um, and then the third offset is AI. Um, wow. And so they, 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 so the U.S. has declared this is like the national security priority number one is to like build AI defense systems. China's done exactly the same thing. Um, and so both of these countries have a very strong push to do that. Um, you know, everybody in the field, you know, agrees that this is going to be a, you know, inc just an incredible change. And we could spend hours just talking about the nature of that change. Yeah, the war. Yeah, thing. look, we're, we're, we're back in a cold you know whether we want to be or not we're back in something of a cold war dynamic where like if they have it and we don't like it's like if the russians had the atomic bomb and we didn't like it's a problem yeah we did we developed the nuclear bomb first and was it not given to the soviet they stole, spies? They, took it. they stole yeah. it they stole it um so the 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 the, the reports are that is that the first russian nuclear bomb was what they call wire for wire compatible um i think with the nagasaki bomb oh wow so, really? so, so there was this famous case there were all these uh this is you know a lot of this is in this movie oppenheimer um the the manhattan project was riddled with soviet spies as was the the U.S. administration at that time, um, and they basically transferred all of the theoretical knowledge, but also they literally there was this guy who literally transferred the wiring instructions. Um, oh my gosh. This is the, f the famous case of the Rosenbergs. Um, yes, uh, so Ethel and Eth Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Julius. Ethel and Julius Rosenberg were the military. Han they were the handlers. They were the NKVD handlers for their nephew, who was a wiring technician at uh, at uh, in the Manhattan Project. I see. And wow. He handed over the wiring instructions, which let the Russians actually build the bomb. Anyway, so like, that, like yeah, so that there was and there. There was this moment, and it was this very kind of fraught with peril thing, because there was this moment where it looked like we were going to have it, and they weren't going to have it. And actually, if you, the, a lot of the, the 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 spies at the time who handed over the information, some of them were just like straight out getting paid. Some of them were just pro Soviet because they thought the Soviets were better. But some of them said, "Look, it's, an un it's going to be an unstable world if one mm -hmm. side has this and the other side doesn't have this." And in fact, John von Neumann, who was a uh, you know key figure in the development of the bomb, he was actually a hawk. He really hated the Soviet Union, and he advocated a first strike. Um, just nuke the Soviets. Nuke first. the Soviets. At first, be, it, we, we, he said, we have a brief window where we have it and they don't. And so we should take them out. Oh, gosh. And, and his famous quote on it was, uh, if you if you say we should bomb them tomorrow, I say, why not today? If you think we should bomb them at five o'clock, I say, why not one o'clock? And gosh, so, man. Right. So that was the, that was the other. So, so that's how that's how tense and serious like yeah. th this exact dynamic that you mentioned is. Right. And so, it, yeah, look, who gets this? Who gets like automated weapons first? Like is a really big deal. Wow. And, and then and then we, we are also back to Cold War dynamics again, which is like, look, there is Chinese espionage in the US. Like they oh, have yeah. they have spies. Um, and, you know, there is like, let's say there is a long, you know, history here of, you know, a long time, 50 years of, you know, they think it's an involuntary technology transfer. Mm -hmm. um, right. Like, you know, secrets being lifted. Um, and the Chinese have a whole system for doing that. My, my assumption is that they have everything that we now have. I would, I would assume I, that's a safe assumption. I think they have everything. Like, I, I think that I think these companies are just the, 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 so American companies. It, it's the, the 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 pluses and the minuses of an open system versus a closed system that you mentioned. The American companies are so open. Like, there's big American tech companies. There's no counterintelligence. There's no security mm -hmm. measures that would prevent somebody from getting hired, who's like you know whatever. Or, or even you could imagine even imagine just an engineer working at one of these companies where they're being blackmailed by the government because their family is in sure. another country, right? So maybe it's not even voluntary on their part, right? Um, nice. 
or, or maybe they just hack in. Or by the way, maybe that you know the way a lot of industrial espionage happens is you just hire the janitorial staff. You, That's interesting. You, you yeah. slip the janitor supervisor, you know, hundred bucks, and they you know stick a USB key in the right computer at three in the morning, and take everything right. And so my assumption is that based on long history in this, is, my assumption is the Chinese have a, basically a nightly download of everything being developed at Google and OpenAI and all these other companies. That does not surprise me. And so the the, the uh, any any idea here that involves putting this stuff back in the box, to your point, has to take into account the fact that the Chinese now have it. And won't do that yeah, if course, they think yeah, they are a race. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. They'll, 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 they'll harness it and use it. It's, the, the nuclear physicist thing is really incredible. It's, I always wonder what those people are thinking. Because after the fact, right, we have the Iron Curtain and the abuses that happen behind that. And were they like, oh, I've made a terrible mistake empowering this regime that it took over half of Europe and essentially stalled the development of the people and countries that it controlled. And when you see East Germany versus West Germany, were they, did they flee and go live there and go, what do you mean there's no food at the grocery store? I just left Minnesota where I lived in the middle of nowhere and had a, the more food than we have in this entire town. What do you mean you're listening to my phone call? Like they, they had to at some point realize I, I've just totally backed the wrong horse. Well, so this was John von Neumann. John von Neumann was very hot, like I said, very right wing, very hawkish. John, John von Neumann was Hungarian. A lot of these guys were Hungarian. And John von, so this was when the Iron Curtain was being brought down across mm -hmm. Hungary, right? And so he wasn't proposing bombing the Soviet Union just like for for fun, or because or he did hate them, but not just because he hated them. Because he's like, look, if if we don't take these guys out, they're it's, they're going to rule Eastern exactly they're your cancer, point. They're, yeah. they're going to rule Eastern Europe half of, half of Europe for the next century or forever, right? And they're going to lead to you know untold misery and death and devastation, which is exactly what happened. Yeah. for the you know for the fifty years or whatever that followed. And so, like, the stakes are super high. And yeah, and, and to your point, like, it, it is very easy. There's a great book I recommend to my friends called, it's called When Reason Goes on Holiday. Mm, yes. Um, I know and it's, it's this new book that came out. And it's basically a book on this topic of what happens when you get these super brainiacs um, who work in these kind of abstract fields and they develop political opinions. And they often develop very, like, I would say, insane political opinions. I agree. And my favorite example of that is Einstein was a Stalinist. Really? And this has been like, you know, whitewashed, you know, completely out of like yeah. the historical record. But this guy goes through in detail all the stuff that Einstein said. Because Einstein became a moral authority. He, he, he spent the last like 30 years of his life primarily engaged in like political and moral philosophical like, like things, um, you know, kind of not physics. Um, and he was a full supporter of the Stalin regime. And he was very anti-American. And he, he said he said in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, America's even worse than Nazi Germany. Um, right? Like he, he was- Interesting a, argument. Oh, yeah, yeah, big time. Um, um, yeah, and 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 like and and so he he got caught up. By the way, as did Oppenheimer himself. He got caught up in this sort of revolutionary communist fervor of that time. And you look back now, and you're exactly the reaction. You look back now, and you're just like, oh my god, how could they have thought this? You know, given what they could have known at the time, and given what we know today. Yeah. And the answer is just, you know, look, they got caught up in the passions of the time, and they became convinced that they were in a position to be able to tell people how to live, and they were gonna, you know, they weren't just they weren't just gonna be, you know, physicists. They were gonna like tell the world how to order society. Yeah. And to be fair, a lot of people who are successful fall into that trap. <laughs> that, that is. True. I don't know if you know any of those folks. <laughs> exactly. That is true. Um, having said that, the track. This is so. This this is like. An argument you get right now in these AI debates a lot, which is like, well, these AI scientists are all saying X, shouldn't we be worried about it? And it's like, well, if X is specific to their work, then maybe yes. But if X is a political opinion, no, 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 intellectual trespassing. They have no moral. They have no intellectual authority or moral authority beyond the bounds of their technical knowledge. Um, and the, the track record on on that kind of expert straying out into unrelated fields is catastrophic. You see it on you see it on X all the time. All the Somebody time. who you're like, well, that guy's really wait, that guy thinks that. Well, wait a minute. Should he? Should we be listening to this professor of this on a topic that's completely different? Like, did he read an article about that yesterday? Have a three whiskeys and post this. I'm confused. And that's really what it looks like from a lot of these folks. And the problem is, we do look to authority, especially younger people. We look to authority and we go, oh, I guess I should agree with that. He's a pretty smart guy. Um, I assume you think about that when you talk on podcasts. Like, there's somebody out there who thinks that I, 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 may, I don't know about stay in your lane because that's a little different. But people take what you say and they're like, "Well, Mark Andreessen is a pretty smart guy, so I better trust this." 
Well, of course, I'm the exception. You are the exception. Yeah. Well, that goes without saying. Um, so having, having, said, having said that. I think I might see the problem here. You, usually, usually what I, what my self image, my image of myself, my view of myself is usually what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to appeal to humility. I'm trying to basically say, look, we, there, there are boundaries on the, there are boundaries on how certain we can be on these things. There's, there are boundaries on like how much control we should give governments. There are boundaries over like how much thought policing we should do. There are boundaries over like how many people should be allowed to weigh in on issues that they don't know anything about. So I'm, I'm, in my own mind, I'm, I'm usually appealing to humility, which is the other, which is sort of the other side of all this. But you know, I'll let the audience decide. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I do, I do agree. Um, but it's very hard to know where the boundary is, and you look to other people to help you set it. And if those people are willing to trespass on that boundary, well, now you just have the same problem all over again.